prospects don't actually value what we what we offer them. So, and the reason why we do this is simply because uh, they we have actually communicated the value to them. We're not speaking their language. We're not actually talking about the problems that they feel and it's most pressing to them. So quite often prospects don't value what we do. Secondly, what I see a lot is particularly in the B2B space is there's not really a growth plan. We're not actually sure from a marketing perspective, how are we going to grow? Uh, we all love word of mouth and referrals. And I think David sort of mentioned that before, you know, hands up who, you know, who loves word of mouth, but it's not scalable. We want something that can actually, we can actually point to and scale. And the third one that I see the, the a problem is that there's often an inconsistent flow of opportunities. So it's a bit like a, a typical Melbourne summer's day. Initially, there might be a, a calmness. So there's not a lot happening in terms of generating leads. Then the next day or the, a few hours later, there might be a deluge for nothing that we can control. So there's usually an inconsistent flow of opportunities. So what is the opportunity when we're trying to attract our ideal clients? The first one is to be a hero for one audience. If we're able to position ourselves as the authority for one profitable audience segment, then it's going to be better for us. It's going to be better for them. And ultimately, uh, we're going to work with more high value customers because we know them better. So it's a bit like uh, there's a couple of different superheroes movies at the moment out now. One is Batman. I think it's out maybe next week. And the other is Spider-Man. And there's a reason why Bruce Wayne only patrols Gotham City. And there's also a reason why uh, Peter Parker only hangs out in, in, I think it's Metropolis. And that's because they just want to be a hero for the, that one city. And that's what I want you to think about with your business. The, second, the, the next opportunity is actually have a strategic growth plan. We want to know how are we going to grow and how we're going to use some marketing tactics to be able to do that. So it's a great way if you can think about having something on paper that will allow you to do to have that strategic growth plan. And the, the final opportunity there is to have a consistent flow of opportunities rather than having that unpredictable nature. We want to have a way to have a consistent flow where we're getting good opportunities with our high value clients. So what are the three questions that we need to ask ourselves if we are going to attract these high value customers? The first one is, what does your business stand for? So what I mean by this, if we're really focusing on the who to start with, so who are we wanting to serve, we can then talk more about the how and the what, you know, how we do it and, and, and how does that sort of flow on from our marketing. So what I want you to think about is really who is your, what we call our perfect future customer, because everything from a marketing perspective and from a lead generation perspective starts with this question. So what I'd love you to do now, if you could type in the chat box, who is the person that is your perfect future customer? So for example, uh, is it a managing director of a consulting firm that turns over between three to $10 million in revenue? Is it a food manufacturing business that turns over between 20 to $50 million? Or maybe is it a podiatrist with more than two clinics? So, who are the who is your perfect future customer? I'd love to just see some examples here in, in the chat. And so the reason why we start with this, we, we what we're trying to do is really niche down and understand the next step, which is the, the problems or the most pressing problems that you solve for them. So recently, uh, for my own for Concurve, my own business, we did a an exercise where we we listed in the uh, the next six to twelve weeks what are the most pressing problems that this perfect future customer has. And ideally, you know, you might start with one, but if you can list six to nine, and then eventually you, you narrow down and get those top three or four or five, then that forms the, the basis for all your marketing when it comes to generating content that gets people to raise their hand within your social media and in whatever, in whatever sort of tactics that you might decide to use. So uh, in your mind so far, when you've been, do if you've been doing some marketing, what is, what's one problem that you see is, is the most pressing for your perfect future customer? And just give it a go, but what's something that you see over and over time? Is it that there's a lack of, of sales? Is it that there's, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's no sense of what a, a branding plan looks like? What, what, what is your perfect future customer struggle with? 
So obviously you do that with your team, you might do that with your clients, but there's just some questions to get you thinking about what your business stands for. And to illustrate this more, I wanna give you the example of a generalist versus a specialist. So in the medical space, on the left over here, you have uh, a, a general practitioner. And quite often, if you've been to a, a GP recently, uh, it's noisy, there's lots of people there, it's chaotic, it's sort of a churn and burn, get in, get out very quickly, and uh, it's not desirable really because they're just trying to get through as many people as possible. But then on the right, you have a specialist. So notice that there's uh, when you go into a specialist's office, it's quieter, it's, 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 uh, it's calm, there's less people, but it's high value, high profitable, and it's a, it's a better niche because they're seen as a specialist in one space. So my wish for you and your business is to really move into the specialist area. And to give you an example in practice, we worked with an air services company recently and they were a generalist. They could essentially fly anyone in, the, in Western Australia. But so what we did was we identified that a perfect future customer for them was a mining company that served particular areas within Perth. And what we found out was you know, they felt that their main problems were around, uh, you know, they valued safety and price. But when we dug a little deeper, we interviewed the customers, we talked to the business owners, it was actually more around reliability. Are they able to serve at all hours 24-7? And once we developed that niche, once we understood and unpacked those problems, the whole marketing campaign went to a different level because we were just the expert for that one particular target market. All right, so you've identified who your perfect future customer is. The next question I wanna ask you is, what's your traffic plan? So to, to kind of get you thinking about this, there's a great series on ABC Ivy at the moment called Muster Dogs. Now, hands up if anyone's heard of it or seen it at all. Have, have, I can see there's some hands there that, that show. Muster Dogs, it's a great show. And basically the premise is that they take five different young Kelpie dogs and over the course of 12 months, they, they train them up to learn how to uh, become a working dog, work with cattle, work with stock. And what they found was at the very start, in the first few months, they just got them, they got, they got them trained up and they, they sort of allowed them to understand if we just work with a small group of, of cattle, we can maneuver them through the gate. And then as they got more confidence, they were able to um, shepherd bigger and bigger groups of cattle and then at the end, they had a massive group of stock and they had a number of different dogs that they added to do the job. So I, wanna, I want you to think about the way that you're generating leads within the same scenario. And I'll give you an example in a sec, but just have one, one dog that you can start with before you, before you go in and, and try a number of different tactics. So to illustrate this, I wanna give you the example uh, of the rule of five ones. Now, this is how I see a lot of companies, and uh, I'm sure, and again, I'm guilty of this uh, at times, is, is actually being very specific. So what we want to do is, this is how normally companies operate. So first of all, uh, we often have three to five different target markets or three to five different perfect future customers. And I know, I know why we do this, because we, we go through a process, we say, you know, look, number one, it's really high value, but you know what, if I, if I we can get some work from number two and maybe number three, that would really help prop us up. And, and you know what, number four, they only buy with us once a year, but if they, could, if they could buy every so often, it would be great for our numbers. Anyway, three to five, does that make sense? Is anyone else in, in the same category? You've got lots of different target markets because you, you don't want to miss out. They, and now you might often have four to, four to eight different solutions. So four to eight different services and products that allow you to, uh, that, that you offer. Also, there might be a couple of different conversion tactics. Maybe it's a sales meeting and then there's a proposal meeting. There's also a number of different traffic sources. So maybe there's four different tra traffic sources and uh, uh, you know, LinkedIn and Google Ads and SEO and, and what have you. And this all happens over the space of two to three years. So you can see how there's not a lot of consistency there. But I wanna give you a tip. Simplicity scales, complexity fails. What about this for an example? Why don't if you just have one target market, one, under, one segment that you understood so deeply, you could become positioned as an expert for that one customer. You have one solution. 
one way of engaging them early on that's low risk but high value and allows you to show your wares. You had one conversion tactic. Maybe it's a qualifying sales meeting. You had one traffic source that you tested and measured over the space of one year. You can see how by being, by being very focused, it allows you to really uh, get better results. And to give you a, a real life example, a personal example of this, uh, there was a company uh, about 10 years ago, they were a marketing company. So they did search engine optim optimization and they were a generalist. They sold to many different types of audiences. And so one day they thought, you know what? We're going to focus on one target market. We're going to be a hero for marketing agencies. Uh, their solution was that they would develop a reporting, uh, reporting software that pulled together all these different tools into one space, which made it very easy for this marketing company. They had one conversion tactic, which, which is a demo call. Jump on the demo call. We'll show you how it works. If you like it, then that's great. One traffic source. You know, many people in that uh, searching for software, they'd be on Google. So it makes sense. And they do that across one year. Now, 10 years later, agency analytics is the undisputed king of software for uh, reporting software for digital marketing and marketing companies. So it does work. It just takes a bit of guts and a bit of uh, conviction to see things through. Now, the, uh, the, the last question that I have for you is, do you engage your prospective clients? And the reason why we say this is because we know that only 10% of people, or there's a small proportion of people who are ready to buy right now. And that's simply because uh, they've gone through a process, they're right at the end of their, their journey. Now, our marketing should not focus on that, that little cohort, because they're going to they're gonna find you. They're going to call you. They're going to email you. They're going to go to your website. They're going to send you a message. We want to focus on this space here, which the people that are not thinking about buying or they're not ready to buy at the moment. That's 60%. Uh, and the good news is if you've done that research at the start, you understand who your perfect future customer is, you've developed and you understand the problems that they face, then it's going to become much easier for you to develop content that really talks specifically to them. They see you as that expert and they're going to more likely go on and, uh, and seek you out for information. So there's a number of ways you can do it. It might be through different ways like social media. Uh, it might be through email newsletters. It might be something like this, like in a webinar. So if you could, in the chat box, I'd love to know what's, what's one way that you engage your prospective, custom, uh, your prospective clients. Is it through webinars? Is it through email newsletters? Do you have an Instagram social media posts? Uh, do you do outreach through LinkedIn? What ways do you engage in trying to attract and get conversations happening with your ideal clients? Uh, would love to know. So an example of this in real life, John, who works as a mediator, he runs his own business. He had a challenge where, again, he was fairly generalized, but what we, what we did was we focused his efforts into being a hero for lawyers in a particular niche. And what we did was over time through LinkedIn and also through email. So we created a library of content, a library of videos, a library of newsletters and different ways for people to engage. We found that by just segmenting and just being focused, um, John was able to then regularly attract and have conversations with lawyers who were in the process of, uh, of helping their customers resolve some issues. So not only did John double his revenue over a 12 month period, but he also was able to get more lucrative clients and uh, he actually won expert determiner of the year, which is an amazing result. So, but all, it, all he did really was just being very simple and just try and be the hero for, you know, for one particular audience. So I guess what we're saying here is I want you to consider you know, who is your perfect future customer? Just choose one. You know, choose one traffic source that you want to focus on. And marketing is all about testing and measuring. It doesn't have to be. But at least have a go at one particular uh, traffic source. And the final thing is I want you to consider how do you engage these people that aren't quite ready to buy yet? You know, have one tactic. And I guess if you've done that initial research, you'll really understand, well, if they live on LinkedIn, or maybe they work best through things like webinars, or uh, if you've already got relationships with them, then are you going to communicate you know, through email? 
What's, what's some ways that you can attract? And then you put that together and you're able to start that process. So what we're going to do, if you are, you know, obviously we'll, we'll talk through some concepts. So we have a, a freebie, an ebook that we have uh, that's available for you. It's a, it's a playbook that essentially talks you through ways that you can define your niche and you can understand how you can position yourself as well as ways to engage your ideal audience. So uh, we've got this available for you. All you've got to do if you like it, you can either scan the QR code with your phone here, or if you're interested, you just need to type yes in the chat box and, uh, and I can give that to you. And you know, as a result, you'll be able to get these tools and you'll be able to start asking these questions to help you really niche down and, and start attracting these ideal clients. So, um, so that's my presentation. I uh, hopefully got some value out of it. And thanks again for listening. I'll uh, throw it back to you, uh, Dave. Awesome. Uh, thanks very much, Andrew. Let's uh, give him a nice round of applause. That was a fantastic presentation. I love the five ones. I think, you know, it's a great reminder. And a lot of people forget that marketing is actually simple. It's just that we complicate it. Uh, humans have this nature of just making things complex. Um, there is also a link in the chat box. Eugene's put that in there. Um, if you would like to uh, pop that in again, Eugene, for people who missed it, you can go to the download. Um, what we're going to do in a moment is we're going to go into breakout rooms. And the reason we do this is because being stuck behind a computer and not talking to other humans is not good for you. So we're going to get you to meet some new people. We're putting you into groups of five. And when we go into these, these breakout rooms, there's two things I want you to do. The first one is I want you to think about where you are in your business right now. When, when we talk to business owners, there's three phases that people are in. They're either chaotic, they're out of control, and they're trying to make ends meet. They're in growth mode, which means they're paying for marketing, they're paying for resources to build their business, or they're finally working on their business nearly 100% of the time, they're in leverage mode. So what I want you to think about is where you are and what's your objective for 2022. So as we go into the breakout rooms, two things will happen. You're going to meet some new people and talk about what was the best thing you got from Andrew's presentation. And the second one is I want you to talk about what is your aspiration for 2022? Where do you see your business going? So Eugene, are we good with the breakouts? Yep, we're all good. Awesome. So uh, on the count of three, you're going to see a join button pop up on your screen and that's going to send you into some random room with some random people to meet and to have a chat for five minutes. Um, uh, we're going to do this by counting to three, taking a deep breath and hitting the join button on one, two, and <gasps> it's interesting. We've talked a lot about having that avatar and making sure we've got the right people uh, in our focus. And we've got this, you know, the, the five ones was the one that resonated with me the most. Um, the next part of the puzzle is when people start knocking on your door, when people start landing on your website, um, how do we know that they're the right people? And how do we make sure that we're converting from the website so we're getting good leads, good inquiries coming in rather than just being sort of inundated with, uh, with, with poor quality leads? So Siobhan Kinsella, who knows Siobhan? Can I just get a quick show of hands for those people who know Siobhan on this call? Awesome. I've known Siobhan for a little while and uh, she's amazing when it comes to understanding website and conversion. And um, so for her presentation today, she's going to be talking about you don't have a traffic problem, you have a conversion problem. And she's going to be talking about the intricacies of getting good conversion from your website. So let's welcome Siobhan to the call. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so thank you, David. Um, uh, been a great, great presentation so far. I'm just going to put this into full screen mode. Everyone see my screen okay? Cool. Um, yeah, so good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to have you here. Um, thanks so much to everyone for being with us today. Um, my name is Siobhan Kinsella, and I am co-founder of Major Creative. We're a digital agency that's really focused on helping our clients actually grow their business by generating more quality leads and ultimately clients or sales from their website. So a lot of the time when clients come to us, invariably one of the things they want or think that they need is to drive more traffic to their site. So if I could get a virtual show of hands, um, if you would like to drive more traffic to your site or you think you need more traffic to your site, can you please pop a yes in the chat for me? Um, so traffic is great, all right? So don't get me wrong. It's not that you don't, that you don't want traffic, but um, without traffic, you don't have leads and you don't have sales. But the problem with thinking that traffic is the solution is that it's basically putting the cart before the horse. If your website or your landing page is not optimized to convert that traffic into leads and sales, 
then like what David said at the start, it's like pouring water into a leaky bucket, which if you can visualize that, it's pretty wasteful uh, and pretty unproductive. So today I'm gonna share um, five simple and cost effective, if not free, things that you can do this week or if you're busy this month <laughs> um, to convert more uh, visitors to your website into actual leads and clients. Um, so number one is um, knowing which levers you need to pull most. So one of the best ways to detect leaks in your funnel is to understand the online growth levers in your business and see which ones need to be pulled or focused on to get the results you want. All right, so each one of these levers works together to create an effective sales funnel. Um, so let's have a look at these levers and maybe you'll be able to recognize or identify uh, the weaknesses in your funnel. Um, so firstly, traffic. We've already talked about traffic. It's really important. It is where it all begins. Without eyeballs on your website, you're not gonna get leads or sales, right? So do you know how many visitors you get to your website every day, every week, every month? Uh, and, um, and, and then, uh, and so, sorry, pardon me. Um, and then leads. So secondly, leads. How many of those website visitors are actually doing something when they land on your website or landing page? Uh, do you have lead generating tools on your website that encourage people to take action on your site? Because ultimately that's what you want people to do. You want people to take an action on your site. Do you have an opt-in for a newsletter? Uh, can they download a guide, a price list, a white paper, a case study? Uh, do you have an upcoming webinar you'd like them to register for? Um, it's really important to have something for visitors who aren't ready to buy from you quite yet, which I think Andrew mentioned in his presentation as well. Um, and look, this doesn't matter whether you're a service-based business or you sell a product, it's still buying. So whether someone's ready to buy your product, or whether they're ready to book an appointment, uh, at that point, they're ready to buy, essentially. Um, but on average, and this is an interesting stat, and it does vary depending on the industry and business, but on average, only 4% of website visitors are actually ready to buy when they land on your website. All right. So if you don't have anything for those that aren't ready, you're missing out on 96% of your traffic on any given day, which is really just leaving money on the table. Um, so thirdly, sales. I mean, this is the ultimate. This is the show me the money part. Um, this is where you'll really see the value of your funnel. Um, if you're a service-based industry, your sales results may not actually be measurable from the website directly, but you can track the leads, the appointments you had, um, and then you can track the sales and actual revenue you converted offline. So what sales or revenue are you currently generating from your website? If you know that number, um, if you know the amount of revenue that you're generating for your website on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis, pop a dollar sign in the chat for me now. Um, it's a really important thing to, to actually know. Um, and last but not least um, is uh, repeat sales, so recurring revenue. How many of your customers are coming back to you again and again? Um, customer loyalty, as we all know, is really, really important. Um, and understanding how you can tap into that um, is, is really, really valuable. Because um, we all know it's a lot easier to get business out of an existing client than it is to acquire a new one. Acquiring a new client is costly, it's time consuming. You have to prove yourself. Um, uh, if with existing clients, if you're providing great service and your model is awesome, they already know you're awesome. Um, so, and you've already paid for them once. I'm a fan of only paying for a customer once. Uh, so it's a no brainer to work on increasing your repeat business to really take advantage of that. And once you know all these numbers, you, you know, you have a clear picture on how much traffic you can get into your site, how many visitors of th those visitors are actually turning into leads and how many of those are turning into clients and sales. Um, then you can use these figures to see which ones need more love. And everyone's going to be different. You're all going to have different uh, areas where you need work. So you may be getting a lot of traffic, uh, but not converting it. Or maybe you're converting a lot of leads, but not getting a lot of traffic. That's your ideal scenario. So if you're in that position where you uh, have a small amount of traffic, but you're converting like a, a, a lot of it, um, most of the hard work is done at that point. Um, then all you need to do is drive quality traffic to the site. And that's actually not the hard part. Often people think that's the hard part, but traffic is everywhere. It's literally everywhere. So, um, so have a look at your figures, sit down and look at that data, see how many leads are coming in, see how many visitors and see where your problem problems are and where your attention needs to go. The picture will paint itself pretty quickly if you do that. So number two is to do user-based testing. So this one, 
is one of the most tried and tested tools to fix uh, a poor converting website or landing page. It's good old fashioned user testing. So what do I mean when I say that? Well, you know, it's not rocket science. It means getting user feedback about your website. So it's really helpful in a lot of ways because it can help you formulate ideas about how to improve the structure or layout of a page, even the site design, copywriting, messaging, calls to action, you name it. Um, and the best way to do user testing is to ask the user to record the experience so you can hear their thoughts and impressions in real time. Uh, we do this a lot with clients, especially when it's a new service offering or something a little bit outside the box, but this really applies to any business. Um, so whether you're an accountant, a lawyer, or you're selling a uh, product online, user testing will give you a lot of actionable insights. Um, and look, the reason why it's so powerful user testing is because as business owners, we spend a lot of time in our business uh, and sometimes it's hard to see the forest for the trees. Hard to be truly objective about our business and things like our website or our logo. We tend to get very attached to things for the wrong reasons. Um, if that sounds familiar, uh, and if you can relate to being a little bit too close to your business to be objective about it, um, then just give, give me a thumbs up. Um, I think we're all guilty of that at some point in our business. Um, so listening to users' thoughts as they go through the site, so you get them to record their experience running through all the pages on your site or on your landing page, as they go, it can be really eye-opening. Um, and the best part is you don't need to do hundreds of them. Like you don't need to spend a lot of money, just start with one, um, uh, and but you don't even really need more than five to get some really, really great value. It's one of those things that seems like it would just be too simple to work, but it just does. So next, number three, um, is conduct micro A-B testing with one user, all right? So this can be in person. Uh, this, you want this to be one-on-one. Um, -on -one. It can be online or it can be in real life. Doesn't really matter these days. Um, but this, this idea takes user testing to a whole other level, right? So we call it micro A-B testing because you simply run the test with just one user. So you might be thinking, well, what am I going to get out of that? What value will I get out of that? There's a couple of reasons why it's really valuable. Firstly, if you're a small business that doesn't have a lot of traffic, then you can't do formal A-B testing. If you get less than 10,000 visitors to your website a month, you just won't get the data. It just won't work. Um, it won't actually function properly. So the next best thing is to get, in front of a, get a user in front of your website. It doesn't even have to cost you anything. You can ask a friend, a relative, someone in your target audience. Um, you're just really trying to get that real immediate no filter reaction from a user as they go through the site. So it's really helpful if you're trying to make a decision between two different lead magnets. For example, like would a pricing guide work better than a case study as a download on my website? Or would a free audit get better traction? Um, or if you're trying to decide between two design directions, for example. It's a really great strategy because sometimes in business, again, we can agonize over things and go, oh, I don't know if I should do this. Or, I don't know if I should do that. When in doubt, Ask a human. Um, don't don't rattle it around in your head for too long. Um, so you, you get them to go through each version each version of the, the page or the site that you're looking at. You don't tell them that that's what they're doing. So don't say, hey, these are two options and I'm trying to figure out which one's best, pick the best one. That will kind of ruin the process. So just let them go through it one by one. Um, and it's important to ask the right questions as you do go along. So things like, um, when you landed on the site, is it easy to understand what our business is about? Do you quickly grasp what we're about? Um, is it clear what makes us different? What we're offering? And things like, you know, where, where was your eye, where were your eyes drawn when you first landed on the site? What drew, what drew you in when you first landed there? You just let them make your way through the page um, and at different points you ask some questions. What did you think of the design? How did the website make you feel? The idea is to keep the questions open-ended um, and don't ask leading questions to try and get them to tell you what you want to hear. Um, uh, and, and like a lot of things when you're, uh, when you're doing things like this is that the most important thing is to talk less and listen more. Um, and make sure you record the session for this micro A-B testing so you can look back on it, see where they clicked and where they didn't, how long they spent on each page. Um, and, and if they spend less time on a particular page, you can ask them why as well. You'll re be really surprised what the results are from micro A-B testing, so I highly recommend it. Oh, sorry, I realised I didn't flip my, flip my slide. So apologies for that. So number four is track your current traffic. So you need to be looking at the numbers in your Google Analytics account. So first up, you need to make sure you have Google Analytics set up. So if you don't already have that, that's step one. 
set up a Google Analytics account, it's free, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, set up Google Analytics, make sure you get your web people to uh, install the tracking code on your website. That's just technical mumbo jumbo. It's very straightforward for any web person to do, but that's, that's so you can track the behavior of users on the website. Um, and the next step, and this is a step that's often missed by businesses, is to set up specific tracking within Google Analytics to track the particular actions that you want uh, potential customers to take in your funnel or on your website. Um, so these are called conversion goals, right? So you might want to track uh, how many people click on the book appointment button on your website. You might want to track how many people click on a button to download a case study. Um, you might, we might have your phone number clickable on the website. You want to know how many people click that. Um, and so you can set up those, um, those conversion goals in Google Analytics, uh, and then you let the data sit for two to four weeks and watch it all come in. And then at the end of three to four weeks, you'll have enough data to see where people drop off. So you might get 100 people to your site, 50 of them might click on the book appointment button, but you only got 10 appointments. So only 10 people actually filled out the form. Then you can start to go back and look at why. Why did they drop off and actually adjust and pivot your website to actually, based on actual results. So, and last but not least, um, send email surveys to your customers. So again, these are all really simple things, cost effective, pretty much free things you can do. Uh, to improve the conversions from your website. So online surveys are a great way to see your funnel from your customer's point of view. Um, you know, you can find out why are they buying from you? So new customers, why did they buy from you this time? Um, why didn't they buy from you? Um, which can be even more powerful information than the people who did buy from you. And, and why they will or won't buy from you again. Um, so that's the power of the customer survey is just to really understand. And it can be a bit of a scary thing, especially if you're an established business, sometimes you might feel like, well, I don't, <laughs> you might be scared about what people are going to say, but you really have to be brave um, and, and just get it out there and ask those questions. Find out what your customers really think of you. Um, so, and you know, just a, a really great quote is, you know, ask one person for advice and it's hard to know whether we should trust them. Ask a hundred and you'll see a clearer picture starting to come together. And you will find if you've got 50 clients, 30 clients, 20 clients, you will find patterns in what they say about your service and why they work with you what, what they find challenging about working with you. Um, and that's a good thing. You can learn from that um, and then improve, improve the conversions from your website and grow your business. Um, so there are literally hundreds of things that you can do to um, uh, improve the conversions on your website. I could talk for days, <laughs> um, but today I just wanted to focus on the basics. And, and from my perspective and the experience I've had, this is what they are. It's knowing your numbers, because you, you can't get where you want to go if you don't know where you are now. How can, you, how can you get there? And getting inside the head of your customers. Ultimately, it's about your customers. So these are the two keys to driving more conversions. And my biggest advice uh, is only, only once you've optimised your site or landing page for conversions, should you think about spending money driving more traffic to it. Um, now, these strategies that I've covered today, they're all really easy um, and low tech to employ, as you can probably see. But if you'd like a head start and skip over some of the work, um, then click the link in the chat, should be there, and we'll send you our 52 point website conversion checklist. This will show you some of the key things that you could, should and could consider adding to your homepage or your landing page to convert more leads and sales and get more for your marketing dollar in 2022. Um, so if you'd like a copy, click on the link. Um, thank you and go forth and convert. <laughs> awesome. Let's get you all on a round of applause. That was an amazing presentation. I really think sometimes, you know, we think about lead gen and we think about we need more leads, but the truth is we don't need more leads. What we need is better conversion in our funnel. We need to qualify our leads. We need to educate our leads and really thinking about what your website is doing because it's the silent salesperson, isn't it? It's one, Once it's set up, it's just sitting there. And uh, it converts 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So making sure that it's working properly, testing things out, asking your client some really great advice. Um, the 52-point checklist, there is a link in the chat box. It's probably scrolled off the screen. We'll get them posted up again towards the end of today's presentation. Um, we're about to go into our second breakout. You're going to meet some new people again and hopefully network like crazy. But just a quick thing before we do... Um, Someone thought this was my son once, this guy. It's actually uh, the new look, but this guy's name is Wilfredo Pareto. And some people know of him through the thing called the Pareto Principle. 
And what we learned is that, you know, it's not that we need more leads. We just need the high quality leads. It's not that we need more time. It's just that we should be spending our time doing the more valuable activities. So out of all the time management books I've ever read, this is the one principle that has stuck with me the most, the 80-20 rule. And it's about saying, what is the best use of my time right now? Now, the problem we have is that our time gets filled, right? Because nature abhors a vacuum. So we end up in this situation where we have to work out what's the best use of our time? What should I be doing more of? And what's the worst use of my time? What should I be doing less of? So as we go into the breakout room, there's two things I want you to discuss. The first one is, what did you get out of Siobhan's presentation? What is the takeaway? And the second one is, what should I be doing more of? And what should I be doing less of over the next year? So let's move into those breakout rooms right now. We're going to have five minutes with some new people. Make sure you introduce yourself and have a nice chat, and we'll see you back here. So on the count of three, uh, are we ready to go, Huge? Good to go. All right. One, two, three, deep breath and join. <gasps> Brilliant. So um, did you meet some new people? Who got some good value out of that uh, last? Uh, yeah, awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce our next presenter, and by no means... Um, you know, we've, we may have left the best till last, right? But uh, when we talk about sales, and so we've talked a bit about getting the, identifying your target market, we've talked about conversion on the website, and where the rubber hits the road is in the sales meeting. And I think one of the things people tend to really be stuck on is how do I become more effective at sales? And uh, when it comes to sales, I also believe, because I'm a big fan of sales training, I've been sort of involved in sales all my life, and I realized, and, um, you know, some people don't like sales, but let me ask you a question. Who, who's married in this in this call? Can I just get a show of hands for those guys married? You're in sales, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who's single in this call? Can I get a show of hands for those guys? We're in sales, right? <laughs> so what I found is if you communicate with humans in any way, shape, or form, you are in sales. And so our next presenter, Frank Ferreira from Stellar Education, is going to be talking about the three pillars to sales effectiveness. So can we get uh, um, Frank up on the call? You there, Frank? Yes, I am. Hi. Awesome. Hi. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Thank you, David. No problem. All right, folks. Dave, thank you for the introduction. Lovely to see everybody here. I love that at the start of this, one of the words that came out was freedom. We're all in business, I believe. I'm certainly in business for, for freedom. I was in corporate for a long time and now I'm in business for myself and I'm really excited about this journey that I've been taking. So today I'm going to talk about... Um, the last part of the funnel. So um, type in the uh, type in, type a yes in the chat box for me if you're keen to hang out with me for, for the next 15 minutes or so. Cool, cool. All righty. Um, so just a little bit about me. I've um, always been customer facing. I'm 21 years in the electrical industry. So most of my time has been spent selling to electrical contractors, engineering consultants, facilities managers, and electrical wholesalers. There's a few of my industry colleagues here, like uh, Anthony, Warren, Alex, and, and Brent, and a few others probably. Um, so very, very niche industry that I loved uh, to work in and develop my sales and management career. So five years of that was spent in Sydney. Um, uh, and the rest in Melbourne. So I've been in Melbourne for 16 years. And I've been lucky enough to be involved in businesses that have, have tremendous growth. I'm talking about growth doubled and tripled. So, you know, from $6 million to $12 million, from $8 million to $26 million, from $6 million to $30 million. These are all real statistics, folks. This, these are the trajectories that I've been involved in in business. And a lot of it's been... Um, all around sales and operations. So as much as I enjoyed that, and as much as I admittedly didn't do it all by myself, always had very good teams around me. Um, what I wanted to do, and what I have done in the last two years is, is develop this business called Stellar Education, which is all about helping businesses develop their sales pipeline, shorten their sales cycle, and increase their conversion rate. So that's really the mission that I have for myself and for business owners. So let's, let's talk about why sales conversion suffer. Now, Siobhan and Andrew have done a tremendous job in explaining, you know, the people that are on our, on our list that are in our view and the people that we need to be talking to. Um, but why don't we pull them through to paying clients? I can give you two reasons. One is we don't have a sales framework. And two, we don't have a sales plan that we follow. So with that scenario, if you don't have a framework and you don't have a sales plan, I can guarantee you your profitability 
will be lower. So when you're looking to scale your business, when you're looking to grow and get into that leverage part of the triangle that Dave was talking about, it becomes very, very difficult. Now, there's a lot of natural salespeople in here. I saw uh, James Muster here earlier. He's an absolute gun of a salesman. And there is some natural ability around that. There's a little bit of art around selling. There's no question about that. But fundamentally, what I try and encourage people to do is treat sales like a science. Follow a framework, follow a sales plan, follow a process. And if you do these things, you will increase your conversions. I will guarantee that. So what I talk about with my clients is really based on the three pillars of sales effectiveness. Now, today, I'm not going to really focus on all three pillars. I certainly don't have the time to do that. And importantly, the things that Andrew and Siobhan talked about, we're really covering off on a couple of these pillars anyway. So when I talk about segmentation, it's about who's on your list? Who are you targeting? Who are you going after? What's the style of client you want? Um, how many are on your list? Um, how many of those do you want to convert? So Segmentation is something I focus on for clients that, that Andrew and, and Siobhan have addressed beautifully. Sales leadership is also about, you know, what are the things you're doing on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis that is going to help you bring customers through to your business? So again, the guys talked about that in a reasonable amount of detail, including things like measurement, um, um, uh, testing and calls to actions and things like that. So what are the things you need to be doing to engage clients on a regular basis to drive that traffic through? Today, however, I'm going to focus on the third pillar. So today is all about sales engagement. This is the conversation. What is the conversation that we are having with our clients or our prospects or our leads to help them understand better what we do so that we can position ourselves to serve them, to bring them through to paying clients. And that's the aim of the game. So focusing on sales engagement, today all I want to give to you guys is, is five elements that are going to help you convert more. So five elements to higher conversions is what I want to give you today. So I want to run through each one of these steps and hopefully you will take away something that um, you can use moving forward. So give me a yes in the chat box if you want some, some skills, some units of skill to take away today after this presentation. Awesome. All righty. So, number one, let's have a reason for making contact. What is the reason you're making the call? Let's get clear about that. If we know who our target audience is and we're engaging with them, then we have some idea about what it is they need and the problem that we solve. So when we engage with these uh, prospects and leads, let's have a think about what it is we want to achieve from that call. Is it that we want to learn something about the client, learn more about what they're trying to achieve, what their frustrations are, what their wants are? Is it to arrange a meeting? Sometimes we make contact because we want to arrange a meeting. Is it to educate them? Sometimes we have some value that we can offer through education so that if we engage the client and we believe they have a need in a specific area, we may be able to educate them, demonstrate them, give them a sample, do something like that. Or is it to close the sale? Now, a lot of people think that following up on a sales call is about closing the sale a lot of the time. They're thinking about the transaction. I'm here to say, when we're making contact with people, let's not focus too much on the transaction. Let's think about, as Andrew alluded to earlier, where is the prospect on the buying pyramid? Because not everybody's ready to buy all the time. And what you'll find, and especially if, you know, in, if you're in B2B, which I've spent a lot of my career in, it takes a number of touch points to build the confidence and trust and understanding of the value you provide before they become paying clients. So anyone that thinks that they can do a one call close, in, in my opinion, is kidding themselves because they don't really understand the value you provide. You don't really understand what they're necessarily looking for. And it takes time to nurture that relationship to achieve that outcome. So number one is simply this, be very clear about the outcome you want to achieve for when you are making contact with either an inbound call or an outbound call. And use one of those four as an example. Does that make sense to people? Type a, type a yes in the chat box if that's making some sense. Yep, thumbs up, good, good. I'll take the thumbs up. That's number one. Number two, 
always add value, always add value. Um, I, I get some feedback from some clients that say, oh, you know, the follow-up, you know, I feel like an ambulance chaser. You're not an ambulance chaser. You're not a pain in the ass. If when you make contact with something, someone, you're always adding value. Now, what can that value be? Let's have a think about that for a second. People want to feel listened to. People want to feel understood. They want to feel like um, they're getting somewhere in life. So do the simple thing. Ask them something about them. Believe it or not, that's the simplest way you can add value to somebody's life. Take an interest in what it is they're doing. And then when you ask that question about them, have a listen to what they're actually saying and acknowledge it. Because often what we do in sales is we just go straight to the transaction. We want to sell the product. We want to sell the service. We want to talk about our thing. And we lose sight of the fact that first we have to listen. Listen and acknowledge. Now, if you have done that well, you'll be in good rapport, then you'll be able to share some insights. So another way to add value is share some market insights. What do you know about the industry? What's happening in the marketplace? What's happening in the economy? What's happening in other businesses that they might be competing with? What market insights can you deliver to the client as part of adding value to that conversation? And last but not least, and these are just four ideas you can take away. Offer some education. Is there a sample? Is there a demo? What can you show them that's going to make them feel like A, they've been listened to, that you understand them, but they're actually taking something away that they can use? So the bottom line here is stop focusing on the transaction. Stop focusing on, I need to get the deal over the line. I need to sell the product. I need to hit the quota. I need to hit budget. Whatever the, the internal goal is, let's just stop focusing on that for a minute and let's Think about how we can add value to the client. That's number two. Thumbs up if that's making sense to people. Yeah, cool. Number three, the psychology of influence. This is my, my favorite thing, my favorite thing. So um, Stephen Covey wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, one of my favorite books, quite the salesman himself. And it's all based on psychology. When we're engaging with people, we must really seek first to understand what are the things we need to do to really empathize with the prospect and the lead so that we understand their point of view. That is critical to develop the relationship and to move the relationship forward. The beauty of doing that, and this is one of the habits of, of in that book, is seek first to understand, then to be understood. If we take the time and make the effort to actually listen and understand the prospect's point of view, then they will reciprocate. They will reciprocate and they will give you the opportunity to share your views. And they don't always have to be the same views, but they will at least be more inclined to listen to you if you first listen to them. Now, the beauty of this is as this conversation develops and you're developing influence in the conversation, you can start listening for cues from the client. So if you believe they have a problem, this target market that you're going after has a problem that you solve and you are having this conversation, you want to start listening out for things that they want and things that frustrate them. What are those emotional things that are either a bee in their bonnet or things that they want to have now that you could potentially help them with. These are the things that you need to listen out for to develop influence. So the bottom line here is selling is not telling. Put your hand up if you've had somebody show up at your front door on the phone or via social media, turn up and do what I call show up and throw up. They turn up and they go, blah, he's my thing that I'm trying to sell. Who's had that experience? We've all had it. We've all had it. People don't want to talk to me because I'm a sales coach because they think that's what I teach. The reality is that's not what I teach. I want to teach business owners to, be, to have empathy and authority. Let's get clear on what the client's needs and wants are and let's see if we can help them. And you know what? Sometimes we can't. Sometimes we simply need to say, look, you're not the right type of client for me. And even by doing that, you're adding value because often what will happen is they will refer someone to you. Who agrees with that? 
who's had that experience? Yeah. Number four, and we're going for time. All right. Number four, we're almost there. So number four, the power of questions. So how do we do all this stuff? Yeah, that's great theory, Frank, but how do you put it into place? Easy. Ask good questions. Questions are the most powerful tool of influence. So if you don't have a good repertoire for asking good questions, I say get practicing on the types of questions you can ask your audience to engage them and do the things in the earlier steps that I talked about. A couple of tips about questions that I've put on the slide here. Chunking. Who's heard of chunking? Has anyone heard of chunking? It's, it's a little bit of a, I think it sort of comes into the NLP psychology, that sort of thing. Chunking is about going to that next question by focusing on the words that your prospects use when they're communicating with you. So if they're talking about very specific things, it's really important that you focus on those words. And by utilizing those words that they are using, asking a second question to help clarify their meaning because people use words and they, and they mean different things to different people. So chunking is a great way to ask that second question so you can clarify their meaning. The second thing you can do, if you are tapping into their wants and frustrations, they will ultimately lead them to a desire, which is a future-paced um, situation. Something in the future is a desire that they are looking for, or it's a fear, something they want to avoid. So by asking these deeper questions, you will find out more about what's important to them and what it is that is going to influence them to make a change. Because ultimately, that's what, that's what we are doing in sales. We are asking our audience to change from what they are currently doing. So what will it take to do that? The power of questions. The final one and my favorite, let's get commitment. I don't know how many sales conversations happen around the planet that end up with what I call coffee and donuts. And that is, we have a nice chat. We talk about some nice things. We talk about the footy and then we, we go away and say, catch you next time. I'm going to say here, ask for the business. Ask for the thing that you originally set out to achieve in the beginning. You've got to ask for the business. And that, and that doesn't necessarily mean the transaction. It could potentially mean... Ask for the meeting, ask for the coffee, ask for the opportunity to present, ask for something. If you don't ask, you don't get. The other thing to make getting commitment easier from your lead or prospect is give them a couple of options because everybody's got a different buying appetite. There's, there's different levels of urgency. So if you create some options, it'll give them the feeling of control. And if they have the feeling of control, they'll have less resistance when it comes to working with you. So a couple of options is a great way to add value. The final thing I want to say about gaining commitment is make it easy for them to buy. What happens next in that transaction? So if they've agreed to a meeting, let's get really clear about when it is, where it is, how it's going to happen, and what the agenda is. If we want them to purchase something, let's get clear about how much it costs, what the terms are, what they have to do to get the product, the easier we make it for prospects to buy, the more chance that they will buy. So folks, that's the five elements of, um, of sales engagement that I hope you can uh, resonate with and take away and start to implement if you're not already doing that. It's a lot of information. I could, like Siobhan, I could spend hours talking about this stuff, days in fact. Um, I live and breathe it every day. But what I'd like to do, if you are interested in finding out more about this information in a little bit more detail. I have created a simple guide. All you need to do is hold up your phone and scan that QR code. And that'll take you to a place that allows you to download this copy of five elements that increases your sales conversions. And I thank you very much for giving me your attention today. And I look forward to speaking to you real soon. Awesome. Give blah. Frank, brilliant presentation. So much good content today. Um, also in the chat box, for those who didn't get that QR code, there is a link that you can go to to actually get uh, Frank's download as well. Um, we're sort of coming towards the end of this morning. We've got a few minutes and we're going to be looking for some questions. And uh, But before we do, there's just a couple of, you know, I know Frank loves his philosophers. I have my favourites too. This is one of my favourite guys. 
Uh, Jim Rohn. Who's heard of Jim Rohn before? Can I have a quick show of hands for those guys? Yeah. Um, when I started this business, he was my favorite because listening to him was like meditation. And one of the favorite quotes I ever had from Jim Rohn was this one, never wish life were easier, wish you were better. Because really, you know, we go through life and things happen. You know, we have lockdowns. We have things happening all the time. You know, some of you might remember the recession that we had to have in 2008. And I find the people that are the most successful are the ones that actually use these as springboards to grow. Today, we've had a lot of great information. And information on its own, and this is my second favorite quote of all time from my other philosopher, mate Bruce Lee, who said, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. And today, who's had some gold nuggets? Can I have a show of hands for those who've had some gold? What I want you to do right now is quickly going through your notes, identify what the top three action items or top three nuggets are that you're going to act on as a result of today. And I want you to either write those in your notes or put them into the chat box, right? Write them in your notes or put them in the chat box. At the same time as doing that, for some of you, um, you're in business and you're a little bit overwhelmed. There's too much to do. Um, our organization has been around for 20 years. And what we do is we help people accelerate the growth of their business. So if you need resources outside of what the guys have presented on today, we can help you and guide you through that as well. So I have a QR code too. Um, but um, the, really what I'd like to do is if anyone has any questions now, let's get uh, Eugene, let's get the other presenters up on the screen. Let's get the other presenters up on the screen. If anyone has any questions or if they'd like to share the biggest nugget they got out today into the chat box now would be awesome. Let's see if we can get some um, insight into what did you get out of today's session? What are your action items? What are you going to do as a result of today? Got a lot of thank yous. Testing website usage, awesome. Um, what do we got? Be water. Yes, Gary, good on you. Uh, listen, listen, listen. Absolutely, you know, I think uh, Frank, was uh, had some pearl of reminders there of really, you know, just understanding that, you know, our job as salespeople is not to tell, it's to sell. And selling usually happens when you ask good questions and you help people. So awesome on that one as well. Um, selling is listening, not telling. Got it. Stop focusing on the transaction. That was a piece of gold from Frank. So thank you for that one. Um, clarify who is my high value client and then build relationships. I still go back to the five ones. I love that idea of just focusing on one, one channel, one element, one conversion, just getting that through your business. And be granular, focused and personalize each step of the engagement. I think, you know, Siobhan talked about the testing and the measuring, the A-B testing, just making sure that we have ways of seeing what's working. There's a reason God gave us two ears and one mouth. So I'm telling you, some salespeople have got two mouths and one ear, I reckon. Um, <laughs> single, single focus, understanding my customer better with better recording of information, 100%. Um, Eugene, can we just get uh, this, all the links that the guys have produced today? In, oh, here we go. Look at that. Um, if anyone wants any of the resources from these presenters, they have done a sterling job of giving us some insight today. I highly recommend grabbing their resources, um, whacking them in your reading list. There's three links there. There's one for attracting your ideal client playbook. There's one for the 52-point conversion checklist for your homepage. And there's one for the five elements, increase your sales conversion. Um, rule of five, awesome. Test to measure, don't focus on transaction. I love this. I love this. Uh, let's give these presenters a round of applause for some coming up with some really excellent content. This has been amazing just to hear this. If you can plug those holes in your leaky funnel, if that's the one difference you make, um, this year is going to be your best year ever. So really, really appreciate you guys, your attention and your time. Um, once again, if you'd like to get any more information, you've got the links. Um, let's unmute and give these guys a nice round of a warm welcome and thank you. Unmute your mic. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Guys, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much for your attention. I hope you got some great value and let's make sure you utilize what you learned today and get some awesome results in your business. So thanks for your time.